Welcome to what promises to be a very stimulating evening. My name is Jules Pelt Feldman, and I am postdoctoral fellow for the research project Performance Conservation Materiality Knowledge, which is sponsored by the Swiss National Science Foundation and which makes its home at the Bern Academy of the Arts here in Switzerland. I welcome you also on behalf of my colleagues in this project uh, and in another called Activating Fluxus, namely Hannah Hörling, Emily Magnan, Argo Wilocha, and Josephine Ellis, and our artistic collaborators, Markus Gosselt and Valerian Mali. Our two projects are the hosts of this evening's event, which is made possible by the research department of the Bern Academy of the Arts, headed by Thomas Gottman, who's here tonight, hello Thomas, and of the Institute of Materiality in Art and Culture, headed by Sebastian de Broskin. The discussion is part of the Forschungsmittwoch or Research Wednesday series. So before we begin, I would just like to briefly introduce our two research projects. Performance conservation materiality knowledge applies the disciplinary lens of conservation to postulate and formulate the afterlives and longevity of performance art, long considered an essentially fugitive genre. And activating fluxus, which is also led by Hannah Hülling, investigates the aftermath of fluxus objects, events, and ephemera created in the 1960s, 70s in Switzerland, Europe, and internationally. The project considers the transitory aspects of fluxus art forms not destined for preservation, and I'm sure we will find many points of connection among these projects and the topics to be discussed today. Tonight we are celebrating the launch of this book, Object, Event, Performance, Art, Materiality, and Continuity since the 1960s, and as you can see, if you haven't yet bought the book, you have a chance to do so for 30% off. The book asks what it means to conserve artworks that fundamentally address and embody the notion of change. And through this questioning, guide us to reevaluate the meaning of art, of objects, and of materiality itself. Object event performance considers the selection of post 1960s artworks that have all been chosen for their instability, changeability, performance elements, and processes that pose questions about their relationship to conservation practices. With chapters by Hannah B. Higgins, Hannah B. Hurling, Gregory Zinman, Andrea Girodi, Alison D'Amato, Megan Metcalf, Rebecca Uchil, Susanna Neubauer, Beryl Graham, and Johannes Hiddinger. It is surely a welcome resource on contemporary conservation for art historians, scholars of performance, dance, theater, and museum studies, curators, and conservators. We will begin this evening with an introduction from the book's editor, Han Hörling followed by brief presentations from four of its contributing authors, Gregory Zinman, Megan Metcalf, Andrea Girodi, and Hannah B. Higgins. Finally, we will conclude with a discussion in which you all are invited to take part. So we won't be addressing questions after each individual presentation, but please do share your questions in the chat uh, or save them to ask later and don't be shy. We're all friends here. And now I will kick things off by introducing Hannah. Hannah number one. Hannah B. Hurling is research professor at Bern Academy of the Arts, where she leads two research projects funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation, conservation, performance conservation materiality knowledge and activating fluxus. Her research, teaching, and publications address subjects in art history and theory, media and material culture studies, museology, conservation, and more generally, American and European art created since the 1960s. She is the author of Pike's Virtual Archive on Time, Change, and Materiality in Media Art, published by the University of California Press in 2017, and Revisions Zen for Film, published by Bard Graduate Center in 2015. Hannah, I am pleased to give the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jules, uh, for this fantastic introduction. Thank you um, so much for also all your support in preparing of this event. There is a very strange feedback I am hearing. I am not quite sure if, um, if this feedback is heard by everyone, but now it's, it, ceased. it ceased to be, okay. Um, so again, thank you so much, Jules. Um, good afternoon, everyone. 
Uh, my name is Hannah Helling, and it is my distinct pleasure to be able to present a few reflections on our book Object Event Performance at Materiality and Continuity since the 1960s, the book which has just been published from Graduate Center in the series Cultural Histories um, of the Material World, edited by Peter Miller. You can see it here in the background, but I'm going to take the book in my hand and present to you again. This book came together, as Jules already mentioned, um, and became what it is due to the generous contributions by its authors. So before going any further, please let me just um, again uh, warmly greet them here. Many, many of them um, are here with us today. Um, Hannah Higgins, this is in um, the appearance order of, 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 uh, of appearance in the book. Hannah Higgins, Gregory Zinman, um, Andrea G. Rodi, um, Alison D'Amato, Megan Metcalf, Rebecca Ukiel, Susanna Neubauer, Beryl Brown, and Johannes Heringer, who contributed their expertise and passion to the volume, and without whom this book would never have materialized. I know almost all of you are with us today, and uh, you will hear um, brief presentations by, um, by uh, Hannah, Greg, and Andrea, as, um, and Megan, as Jules mentioned, just in a few minutes. Uh, and if you would like to discuss with our other authors, it will be the possibility um, to do so uh, in our um, um, Q&A in the roundtable after the short presentations. So let me get um, to the presentation. It matters what ideas we use to think other ideas with. It matters what matters we use to study other matters with. It matters what stories we tell to tell other stories with. It matters what knots, not knots, what thoughts think thoughts. And this is one of my favorite quotations from Donna Haraway, Staying with the Trouble, a book that the Feminist Theories published in 2016, as it exemplifies the entanglement of our world and the importance of our choices and how even the tiniest part in the system determine, to determine the kind of um, uh, the working or the mattering of the universe. I am convinced that our book is an evidence of su successful working together. The book is about the modes of artistic expression that emerged since the late 1950s and the beginning of the 1960s, happenings, performance, video, experimental film, fluxus activities, and the emerging practices of media art that question the idea of art that endures unchanged and thus might be subject to a single interpretation. In contrast to traditional visual art, the blending of genres and media began to transform not only the curatorial and museum collecting practices, but also the traditional function and mandate of conservation, which became augmented to accept the inherent dynamics and changeability of artworks. The book asks, how do these works endure over time despite their material and conceptual changes? How do their identities unfold in relation to ruling knowledge, values, politics, and culture? The book examines the physical and immaterial aspects of artworks at the intersection of art history with theory, material culture studies and conservation, focusing on artworks that evade the familiar stability or the forever aspect of traditional art forms. Intrinsically changeable and often of short duration, these unstable artworks challenge art, conservation and museological discourses. Not only do they test standard assumption of what, how, and when an artwork is or can be, but they also put forward the notion of materiality in the constant flux that plays a significant role in the creation and mediation of meaning. The conception of conservation put forward in this book is, um, is an extended conservation or the titular continuity. Conservation here is a participative practice, an epistemic that is knowledge generating activity that encompasses many cultures and understanding of what it means to conserve. I mean, with cultures of conservation, the sets of social practices characterized by shared values, conventions, attitudes, goals, and patterns of human knowledge, as well as beliefs and behaviors that depend on the capacity to learn and transmit knowledge to succeeding generations. The formation of these cultures apply not only to such aspects as uh, uh, such aspects of contemporaneity as 
the continuance of medium, network, and institution-specific cultures of care, but also to the historical evolution through restoration, rehabilitation, renewal, and revival. Today, however, conservation not only acts within, but also is also enacted outside its safe spaces, analytical laboratories, heritage institutions, and museum departments, just as conservation thinking persists in other domains, in minds, hands, and practices from curatorial, archival, and registrarial to artistic. The cultures and understanding of conservation, including highly specialized conservation scholarship are contingent on the subjective viewpoints and situated knowledge of the actor participants in conservation, which are in turn determined by the conditions in which this knowledge is produced. The encounters with the materiality of artworks in this book originate from the author's interest in the conditions that determine an artwork's ongoing life. They emphasize the importance of conservation thinking and thinking about conservation and explore how these factors enrich, shape, and help reformulate theoretical and historical discourses. That's what follows spans active learning from the past, acting in the present, and glimpses of the future. The already well-established turn towards materials and materialities in recent cases is refocused through and as a conservation question. We aim to attract many other voices and responses that will continue to expand discursive frameworks and challenge established disciplinary boundaries. Object event performance combines the perspectives of art historians, media, performance, and conservation. Sorry, the um, perspective of historians of art, media, performance, and conservation, as well as artists, scholars, and professionals working in media and curatorial fields that are devoted to the material and conceptual lives of artworks. The essays reflect on the ways in which artworks created since the 1960s are conserved, perpetuated, presented, and conceptualized, each from a particular perspective. This volume is based on the belief that cross-pollination among disciplines and professions generates new perspectives on art and its world, as well as novel encounters with the ever-changing materiality of artworks. The essays expose the entangled material, spatial, and temporal relationships in which artworks exist. In addition to placing conservation questions in dialogue with humanities disciplines, <clears throat> the contributions to this, volume, to this volume attempt to acknowledge conservation as valid theoretical disciplinary framework that can be accessed and operated not only by conservators, but also by non-conservators. Crucially, this book allows the participants in conservation and non-conservators to take a stand. Here are a few questions that were taken up by the authors of this book. How the works of art transition over time as they are impacted by the processes of institutionalizing, presenting, archiving, and conserving artworks? What does it mean to conserve, document, and archive recent art? Can the notion of conservation be sustained? How do curatorial approaches and methods of documenting and distributing artworks affect their identity? And I will very briefly actually share, um, <clears throat> excuse me, my table of, the table of content here. It's very slowly coming up. Yeah, yes, you, you might see it now. <laughs> okay, so um, there are a few questions with which I just began, and um, you might see um, them reflected in, in the contents of the book in the chapters. Um, what does it mean to conserve, document, and archive recent art? Can the notion of conservation be sustained? How do curatorial approaches and methods of documenting and distributing artworks affect their identity? And these are questions really um, that have been pertinent to all authors in the book. What is the relation between a work and its core instruction in its, sorry, in its, and its core instruction or notation? 
what role do these considerations play in the work's material and conceptual continuity? And those questions were pertinent to chapters by Hannah Higgins, Alexander Mato, Megan Metcalf, and myself. What if an artwork eternally returns in background forms of moving image, moving also because of its media transpositions in Gregory Zinman? What if an artwork is inseparable from its environment, so much so that its preservation must include the consideration of the view shed because it is impossible to define a single vantage point from which to view the work and thus its beginning and end in Rebecca Ukil. <clears throat> Excuse me. What if display and curatorial work perpetuate works that are particularly sensitive to the interrelatedness of their physical components and their faces in Susanna Bauer, Neubauer? <laughs> Where should the so-called new media be placed in relation to the singularity and uniqueness of traditional objects and how does system thinking allow us to deal with the new media variability? in Beryl Graham. Where does the archive begin and end? And end? How does it relate to the artwork that it archives? What does one make, how does one make sense of the archival preservation of the artwork's traces, props, and leftovers? And this is um, pertinent to Johannes Hedinger uh, in his open-ended work, Bloch. Johannes Hedinger and Markus Gossold created the work Bloch, and the chapter uh, closes the book. What is the artwork's relation to time? Can artworks be conceived as events, performances, and processes? What consequences would such conception have for the per perpetuation? I think these questions are um, um, present in all, um, in all chapters, but in particular in my contribution on Franz Erhard Walter. Can performance be a method to keep the material and structural aspects of the works produced since the 1960s and 70s alive? Can it work against the deadening effects of relegating these works to the archives in Hannah Higgins? And lastly, what if a heavily decayed, perhaps even a dead work is allowed back to the limelight, not only to promote a radical aesthetic, but to test whether conservation allows a work to decay? In Andrea Girode. All in all, the authors in this volume offer approaches to answering this and related questions that develop out of a slow analysis or condition reporting of sorts that works uh, toward a deep awareness of the conceptual and physical frangibility, one that reveals the inner structure of things, the material flows and dynamics. Okay. <clears throat> and most importantly, one that enhances material knowledge. Sorry, I have a... <clears throat> I hope I was able to awake your curiosity about the book <clears throat> and about the presentation by our eminent guests that will follow shortly. Let me take a moment to acknowledge that this, is, uh, that this book would not have been possible without the generous support of Peter Miller, the serious editor and Dean of the Bad Graduate Center in New York City, as well of, the, of Dan Lee, the center's publishing director who invited me to think about this book back in 2015. The invitation followed the conference Revisions, Object Event Performance since the 1960s organized on September 21, 2015, for the opening of the exhibition revisions and for film at Bar Graduate Center Gallery, New York. Both the symposium and the exhibition resulted from a research project during my Andrew W. Mellon visiting professorship at Bar Graduate Center, and I am vastly indebted to the Mellon Foundation for their support of the BART initiative, Cultures of Conservation, and my position therein. A subsequent session in February 2018 at the College Art Association in Los Angeles, as well as further discussions among scholars of performance, dance, media, conservation, art history, and material culture studies, as well as curators, conservators, and other professionals developed the topic further. I also owe thanks to my graduate students at the Bard Graduate Center and in the Department of History of Art, University College London, especially those who contributed to the performative seminars on the occasion of Intermedia Arts and Materiality um, graduate module that I taught at UCL. And I know that some of them are present here today. So it's, it's my pleasure to see you. 
My further work on this book was supported by my then home department of history of art at UCL and the Terra Foundation for the American Art at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, DC. And the finishing touches on the book were made in Bern at the HKB Institute for Materiality and Art and Culture for the materiality um, in art and culture, also the host of today's event for which we are very, very grateful. The concluding steps were made as the research project, performance, conservation, materiality, knowledge made possible by the general support of the Swiss National Science Foundation began, began in Bern. The SNF has since founded our second project, uh, Activating Flexus, which is thematically related to the book, as Jules mentioned, and the SNF remains an invaluable sponsor of our activities for which I and my research teams are present here remain uh, more than thankful. Finally, and again, my deepest thanks to the contributors to this volume, Hannah Higgins, Gregory Zinnemann, Andrea G. Rodi, Alison Damato, Megan Metcalf, Rebecca Ockil, Susanna Neubauer, Beryl Graham and Johannes Hedinger for their passion, dedication and responsiveness to editorial suggestions. Thank you so much. And I am passing the mic back to Jules. We will now hear from Gregory Zinman, who is Associate Professor in the School of Literature, Media and Communication at the Georgia Institute of Technology. He's the author of Making Images Move, Handmade Cinema and the Other Arts, University of California Press 2020. And his writing on film and media has appeared in many worthy journals and periodicals. He has also programmed film and media at a diverse collection of venues. Greg, looking forward to your presentation. The floor is yours. Thanks so much, Jules. Uh, I'm going to share my screen with everyone. And thanks to Jules for all of your hard work in uh, putting this event together. Thanks to Sophia for all of your technical expertise. And of course, thanks to Hannah Holling uh, for bringing us all together and all of your incredible work on this important volume. Um, I'll begin today with a quote from the artist at the heart of my brief presentation, Nam June Peck. Compared to satellite, exhibition is just peanuts. In a 1989 interview with Japanese architect Arata Izazaki, media artist Nam June Peck reflected on a, his recent trio of satellite broadcast works Good Morning, Mr. Orwell from 1984, Bye Bye Kipling from 1986, and Wrap Around the World from 1988 saying, quote, you were only born once, you only die once. The most important things happen only once. A human being has an essential yearning or angst for the non-repeatable. The reason I became well known through destructive art was also because of this non-repeatability. Once you break an expensive piano, it cannot be put back together. Once you throw water on the ground, you cannot scoop it back up. From this fear and yearning born of the fragility of life, our philosophy of the quote unquote, eternal return emerges, end quote. Pake here connects his satellite works, one-off international television broadcasts beamed into millions of homes to his earlier action music pieces. Those pieces, such as one for violin from 1962, saw the artist playing an instrument by bashing it to smithereens and were easily legible as non-repeatable events. As real-time performances, the satellite works were non-repeatable events of another sort, offering a dizzying compendium of art, music, dance, and sport from multiple nations, enhanced by Paik's characteristic image effects. In an era characterized by intensifying Cold War conflict and the threat of nuclear annihilation, Paik's satellite pieces offered sincere, if fleeting, moments of international communion. Yet, even as the satellite pieces faded from the screen and their original viewers returned to their everyday lives, the works would experience a series of returns. As with so much of Paik's output, the satellite works provided the artist with self-recyclable material, first as edited single-channel video versions that could be distributed and exhibited as art world matter, secondly, appearing in his increasingly large multi-monitor installations, and finally, as various forms of online viewing. Each of these returns was not merely a recurrence in the Nietzschean sense of exact repetition of a prior event or sensation. Rather, it was a mutation or metapsychosis, a remix that curator David Ross calls Paik's quote unquote video compost. The eternal returns of the satellite pieces constitute an aggregated body of work that continues to change and take on new life 
even in the present day. Now, how the satellite pieces managed to become the Elan Vital of many of Paik's later artworks, and how those artworks pose challenges to the reception and preservation of live video art constitutes the longer version of this paper that you'll find in the book. Paik's self-created media ecology finds him reworking his own art to new ends and represents a kind of me mix as opposed to remix. And you see this borne out by the title of My Mix 81, uh, for example. And this takes not just images, but concepts as well from one media formation and applies them to another. Indeed, the ideas undergirding the production and continued circulation of the satellite pieces opens up pathways for rethinking Paik's oeuvre as well as the relationships between the preservation, exhibition, and understanding of the history of video art. In the immediate aftermath of Good Morning, Mr. Orwell, Paik's enthusiasm for satellite art was unbounded. One year after its airing, he wrote that the platform represented, quote, the highest art form humankind has invented, as the miracle is the cornerstone of every major religion in the world. Onceness constitutes the very motor of human history. Through live video art, we are finally able to deal very concretely with the central problems of human existence, chance, hazard, bat, venture. Pascal and Sathwa would be very jealous of video artists, end quote. Onceness was a concept rooted in Paik's Fluxus performances, one that he applied to his decades long inquiry into the way media technologies could be repurposed as conduits for communication, participation, and collaboration. Sparked by the appeal of live television, Onceness was about conveying a sense of spontaneity and danger to the normally tightly controlled realm of broadcasting. It contained, as Paik wrote three weeks after the broadcast of Good Morning, Mr. Orwell, a, quote, mystique, not recordable in the videotape, end quote, that resulted in a work wherein, quote, a delicate, fragile, yet concrete harmony was stretched between millions of highbrow families of America, end quote. As a means of making art, onceness was both shocking and ephemeral, providing a different kind of interaction with media for artists and audience alike. Live video art, at least conceptually, also complicated the artwork's status as a commodity. Its non-repeatability did not mean that it was created outside of the circulation and systems of global capital, but it did mean that it did not function in a typical way in terms of the traditional art market. Now, this was appealing for Paik, who consistently sought to make audiences participants rather than mere consumers, and who invade against art world norms related to the dissemination of creative works and acts. A live broadcast on public television, after all, could not be additioned and subsequently sold to a few wealthy collectors. Despite their onceness, the satellite pieces hardly ceased to exist once they'd been broadcast, living on in a variety of edits. These single channel versions of the satellite pieces are the ones most familiar to the art going public. While they serve as crucial instantiations of the work, they necessarily lose the initial airing sense of performative daring do. No longer live, they are incomplete documents of erratic diminishment, cleaned up displays of Paik's ingenuity and collaborative spirit, lacking the live wire precarity that made them singular events. To that point, it is currently impossible to see the satellite pieces as they were originally presented. In this way, Paik has intentionally or not enacted a perverse kind of pres preservation and that he's ensured ins that the initial airings remain singular occurrences incapable of being perfectly replicated. As they existed for their run times, the satellite pieces did not function as traditional artworks to be bought and sold, but consumed for free on public television. The satellite pieces were not about an artist hawking his wares to well-heeled collectors. They were about attempting to communicate on a nearly unprecedented scale. As Paik wrote, quote, we have shown a way to make peace a thrilling entertainment, end quote. At the same time that Paik was exploring the possibility of reaching mass audiences via satellite, a new multi-screen platform was starting to become available in Europe and the United States. These vast arrays of linked video monitors, known as video walls, were the province of trade shows and theme parks, department store windows, and Broadway shows, and they became one of Paik's preferred mediums in the 1980s and 1990s. 
just as he had reconfigured other media throughout his career, from fashioning prepared pianos to placing magnets on television sets, Paik recognized that he could use the spectacular qualities of the video wall to revisit his older works while fostering new collaborations. The video walls were, for Paik, the perfect vehicle for remixing and recontextualizing the satellite pieces for new audiences and different environments. The video walls were at once an extension of the satellite works and an indirect refutation of them. The scale of the audience Paik enjoyed for the satellite pieces, which reached into the tens of millions, seemingly began to inhabit the material qualities of Paik's multi-monitor installations. It was as if he wanted to bring the millions of televisions receiving the broadcasts in individual living rooms around the world and together in a combined electronic fever dream of simultaneity and proliferation. The satellite works had spurred Paik to think about acceleration and velocity. As he wrote shortly after the broadcast of Rap Around the World, quote, satellite art has gone into the realm of future tense, end quote. Paik's video walls are colossal installations, but their video components are a glut of decontextualized information. No longer charmingly clunky utopian visions of global connectivity, the satellite pieces adorn these video walls as baubles hanging on the redwoods of the technological sublime, monuments to data flow where Paik's previously valorized topics of interaction, two-way communication, and collaboration vanish in favor of a seeming indifference to the humans beholding their spectacle. Whereas the satellite works went out of their way to represent quote unquote foreign people to other nations, the video walls seemingly diminish humanity. A more generous reading of them would take that feature as the work's central point. They instantiate a mediated world where image proliferation drawn from a history of image making, re-edited, filtered, and processed to the extent where its origins are occluded or made suspect outstrips humanity itself. Pick was to varying degrees platform agnostic, always looking to discover how images could be made, reshaped, disseminated, and shared. It would have been fascinating to see what Paik would have made with other post-video platforms, such as augmented, mixed, and virtual reality, and whether the satellite works would have continued to manifest as reoccurrences, finding new homes and new technological bodies. Ripe for rediscovery and reconsideration from both technological and transnational perspectives, the satellite pieces provide an opportunity to rethink Paik's work and video art more broadly. Quote, thanks to technology, Paik wrote, we can live not only in the future, but also in the past. We have to go back and forth, end quote. Equal turns prescient and naive, hopeful and electrifying, the satellite pieces continue to remain works ahead of their time. Video arts, past and present, future tense. Thanks so much. Thank you, Greg. That was fascinating. Um, I look forward to hearing more during the discussion. And uh, as I said, if you have questions, please feel free to share them already in the chat um, or to, to save them for the discussion we'll have at the end. And now um, I will continue on introducing our next speaker. Megan Metcalf, who is a scholar as well as a practitioner of dance, visual art, and their intersection. She is currently History of Art and Visual Culture Fellow at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And her research has been supported by a number of prestigious institutions, and her writing has appeared in numerous publications. Megan is currently working on a book about the appearance of dance and performance in contemporary art spaces. And I very much look forward to your presentation. Megan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jules. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, and of course to Hannah for inviting me to participate in this important volume. I'm gonna share my screen um, and I'm just gonna talk rather casually through my contribution in hopes that it will provoke you to um, take a look at it. Um, so, so my chapter um, began with this oddity or really a curiosity that I observed when I was um, doing field work at a um, retrospective of the artist Simone Forti. Um, this was, as you could see, it is an onion balanced on the lip of a bottle. Um, and I was, I saw it hanging out at the side of the gallery when we were working on um, the installation. So um, here it is highlighted in the background. 
Um, that's the artist in the foreground with the curator, Sabina Breitweiser. Um, so this show was incredibly devoted to historical accuracy. Um, it it um, attempted to recreate a number of Forti's performances from their very first um, presentations, and um, it, it gathered together um, a great deal of her material production. It was in, very invested in presenting her as a visual artist and not as a movement art artist, which is, or in addition to her being a movement artist, which is how she had been known up until that point or largely known up until that point. Um, she's an incredibly influential figure for American dance and has also made um, artworks in many different mediums for a very long time. Um, so <clears throat> at the at the edge of this at the edge of this exhibition was this onion. Um, and it actually wasn't the one in the upper left that you see here. It's the one that I captured in my own iPhone photographs. Um, and it did not have a sprout. And um, the artist let the curator know, like, this one isn't going to work because it's not going to um, sprout during the run of the exhibition. What she's doing in the middle photograph is um, reading a, a text that was presented on the wall without any context. Um, it um, presents this narrative of the onion sprouting and then falling off of the bottle. Um, so this whole thing seemed to me really strange. Uh, what was it doing there? It had a it had a title, um, but that title was one thing in um, it, in the catalog, which called it Onion on a Bottle, and another thing in, in the exhibition, which called it Onion Walk. It had two dates, which is fairly common, but it was 1961 slash 2014. Um, and I knew a lot about the artist production, and I just couldn't figure out what this was doing there. So my chapter um, traces my journey through finding out what it was, and I'll relay some of that to you. Um, so um, I, most of all, I wanted to know what was authorizing it in this context. Like it was, it was in a museum. So it was um, presented as having some kind of fidelity to the past or to the artist. Um, but, but beyond that, I, I didn't really know where I came from. Um, so I started asking questions. Um, the, the, the immediate precedent for it was fairly easy. The curator had seen this at the, um, in Madrid the year before in an exhibition. Um, that was that was bringing together the production of a number of contributors to a work of um, conceptual art, or rather, sometimes also called poetry. Um, this this volume and anthology um, included five texts by Simone Forti, um, and the exhibition in Madrid was working to, to create a material show for this um, publication, um, and the the. The possible um, artworks for that show were a little bit slim. The main archive for an anthology was not open to researchers. And um, so they were they were coming up with a lot of different ideas on on how to how to manifest these works in the present. So um, uh, staging Forti's works were somewhat obvious in that regard. Um, they um, restaged a couple of the performances that are on the page in an anthology. And this is the onion as you see it in the foreground. So they um, perched that onion on the bottle and set it to do its its walk or to do, you know, to fall off the bottle. Um, and in this regard, that's fairly straightforward. It's fairly simple. It was a performance. They staged the onion as a performance. Um, they interpreted it. They interpreted that text as a score. Um, and, and that's fairly straightforward. Um, it's, it's an easy interpretation to do. Uh, it share, these share the page with um, the onion text, which is at the top. Um, these two works called the dance constructions um, were, were created around the same time um, as, as Forti contrib contributed these texts to an anthology, which was sometime in this early 1961. Um, so these two works are works of dance and that kind of combine the features of dance and sculpture. They also are, are works, something like um, conceptual art, which you can see via their inclusion in an anthology. Um, they also, and, and these works have been, have been restaged hundreds, if not thousands of times in the case of Huddle, which is what we call the top one. Um, you see, you, you can see these are historic performances of these works, but certainly not their first performances. Um, and of course, that text shares so much with other works that were um, that were born in that period. So um, 
so using the the text as a score for enacting a work in performance or even enacting a work in sculpture is a very common thing to do um George Breck's drip music is an example of that um these three different iterations um, as a text, as a live performance, and as a sculpture have been called all the same work. Um, that's one of the chief arguments in Natalie Hiron's important book. Um, what anthology does, that, um, that book, what it does is emphasize the um, closeness of these, of these forms. Um, but what I had always understood about that score, about the Onion score, the one that um, Forti had contributed to the to the um, anthology was its significance for dance, which is that she read it aloud in a composition class. She stood up in front of her composition class and read it aloud um, to her companions. And in the context of that composition class, where students were applying um, John Cage's scores to movement, they were conducting these brief little experiments to generate really quick really quick, um, really quick dances, really short compositions. Um, Forti was asserting that a score could be a, uh, I'm sorry, that a text could be a dance, that reading could be, a could be a dance, much in the same way that her colleague Steve Paxton proposed that eating a sandwich could be a dance. And this is how I'd always understood it. And I felt really attached to this idea of um, the text not needing and any kind of a physical manifestation, simply the artist reading it or simply that act. Um, I felt really attached to this. Um, so I was worried, of course, that the installation was changing the nature of the thing, that the onion was changing the nature of the thing. Um, but the more I thought about it, the more I was, I was um, thinking, what if, and, and this is what I trace in the, in the, in the um, chapter, what if, in addition to being a provocation for, for dance, the dance report, as, as Forti called it at the time, is a provocation for institutions. Um, and the more I thought about it, the more I, was, I looked around and saw like, actually this type of production is all over the museum. Um, we see it especially strongly because of Forti's ties with dance, because of her background with dance, but this kind of production is everywhere. So we see it in the fabrication, the fabrication and refabrication of minimalist artworks, uh, sculptures. We see it in something like the Solowit wall drawings. We see it in Lawrence Wiener's text. Um, this one in particular has to do with ephemerality. Um, these are installed for the length of the, the show, and then they're usually thrown away or or painted over afterwards. Um, <clears throat> dance has an openness to change and dance has an openness to um, this reuse and recycling of parts. In, in case of dance, it's people's bodies um, that can give a work an identity over a long period of time. So my chapter is talking about how dance models can be used to um, think through these pieces um, over time. Um, the more I tried to verify this, the more I, the more I got invested in the historical, um, the historical origin of the onion, the more slippery it became. And um, the more I started thinking about it as a provocation for um, the people involved in museums as well as historians. So I hope you'll enjoy the chapter and, um, and be able to make those connections between or, or follow my journey on how we can relate um, dance models of preservation to sculptural models. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Megan, for that provocation and those beautiful um, dancing onions, <laughs> which I love as a, as a, as a kind of um, intermediate object, the onion. And again, if you have questions, comments, please share them. We'll get to them. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce Andrea Girodi, who is director of the Frederick R. Wiseman Museum of Art at Pepperdine University in Malibu, California. In addition to her work as a curator at several wonderful institutions, she is also an art historian, editor, and critic, and has contributed writing to many influential journals and magazines. 
Andrea's curatorial projects include After Lives of the Black Atlantic 2019 to 2020, which she co-curated with Matthew Francis Rary at the Allen Memorial Art Museum at Oberlin College, and the traveling exhibition Forms Larger and Bolder, Ava Hesse Drawings 2019 to 2022, which she co-curated with Barry Rosen. Andrea, I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Jules. Let me go ahead and share my screen. To stop share. There we go. There we go. Floor is here. Thank you. Give me one second. Let's pull this up. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jules. And thank you, Hannah, both for the invitation to share this work today and Hannah for shepherding this volume, which was um, no small task. Before I delve in, I just want to note quickly that what I'm about to present does include nude photographs and more specifically images of bodies undergoing cancer treatment. Um, I don't want to shy away from any of that material, which is pretty core to Hannah Wilkie's work, but I don't want anyone to be caught off guard. Um, so with that, I am very pleased to present here a very short version of my essay, Resurrecting Hannah Wilkie's Homage to a Large Red Lipstick. In 2017, I began a position as curator of modern and contemporary art at the Allen Memorial Art Museum in Oberlin, Ohio a college museum with an excellent collection. Soon after I arrived, I asked my predecessor whether I should know about any objects in disrepair that might be in need of attention. She ticked off a few works, including a latex-based sculpture by Hannah Wilkie that had been unexhibitable for many years. Homage to a large red lipstick, completed in 1974-75, makes cheeky reference to a project by Wilkie's then boyfriend, Klaus Oldenburg, namely the renegade public sculpture he erected at Yale University in 1969. Perceived as a wry commentary on the Vietnam War, Oldenburg's lipstick ascending on caterpillar tracks featured a mock military tank topped with a partially flaccid tower meant to inflate and deflate, pointedly installed without permission in a spot that overlooked the office of Yale's president. It was eventually replaced with a more permanent version in a less prominent location on campus in 1974. That same year, Wilkie began working on what would become homage to a large red lipstick, one in a series of latex-based sculptures she had been producing since around 1970. And these are just a few of many examples. Wilkie's homage radicalized the feminizing motif of Oldenburg's monumental sculpture, substituting a form and palette inspired by flushed vaginal lips for Oldenburg's phallic lipstick and an iconography of reproduction and proliferation for one of destruction and violence. By the time I examined homage and storage, the work had been shelved for more than 40 years. The photograph we then had on file, regrettably in black and white, showed a wall-mounted sculpture comprised of uneven wavy sheets in a range of tones bound together into a long lozenge with the sheets fanning outward like an open accordion. What we found when we opened the box in which the work is housed today was something like a deflated version of what had once existed. This is usually when people in real life gasp out loud at this photo. The sculpture had been divided into several parts and stacked, separated by sheets of glassine in a single box. The once pliable glossy latex sheets had shrunk in size and turned rigid and brittle. The pins that once held the sheets together, allowing them to cling on the wall in Wilkie's intended shape had migrated and dislodged, and the deep maroon that Wilkie had tinted the latex had become much lighter and duller. The off-gassing that emanated from the boxes also signaled chemical rot. Homage had been effectively dead for the majority of its time in the collection, meaning that it has never been exhibited nor made available for research. Wilkie's sculpture has been examined twice by conservators over the years, and both reports suggest that a combination of naturally fugitive materials and poor storage strategy have contributed to the work's demise. In 1986, the examining conservator wrote, the latex material is chemically unstable and deterioration is in progress. In some areas, the latex has become hard and cracked. In other areas, it has become tacky and a number of pieces have stuck together. Because of this physical deterioration, the shape of the sculpture has changed. The original arrangement of the sections of the latex has been disrupted and the lively three-dimensionality of the sculpture has been flattened. A conservator who assessed homage in 2003 concurred, writing, homage to a large red lipstick 
suffers from both chemical deterioration and improper treatment. These problems had already become critical barely 10 years after the sculpture was created. In the ensuing 17 years, the condition has only worsened. The piece is now fossilized in a shape which the artist never intended. At present, the only treatment which can be recommended is to freeze the object indefinitely, taking proper precautions to protect its surfaces. While this will not stop the deterioration, it would slow it so that at some point in the future, treatment for such a badly deteriorated latex, latex art may be discovered. The demise of other latex-based works by Wilkie from this moment in her career suggests that even conscientious care might not have protected the work from inevitable decay. Wilkie herself was aware of the issue and by late 1974, she had learned how to stabilize the material. Works produced after that time have for the most part fared dramatically better. That said, a cure for Wilkie's homage given the extent of its deterioration seems highly unlikely. In the meantime, it sits in the museum's basement, visible to no one, gathering proverbial dust. Dissatisfied with leaving homage in obscurity, I wondered whether Wilkie's practice might have allowed for entropy, change, decay, and even death in the case of her sculptural works. Whether, in other words, some aspect of her work might justify exhibiting homage as it is. Wilkie, who died from lymphoma in 1993, cannot be consulted, nor do we have evidence that she considered this particular proposition while she was still alive. But what I found in looking closely at Wilkie's wide ranging body of work, extensive correspondence and published interviews is that she not only allowed for decay, but radically embraced it. In the Fuller essay, which you can read in the book, I contend that homage in its current state resonates pow with powerful aspects of Wilkie's body of work. Her sustained emphasis on gesture and ephemerality, the alignment between her physical self and the work she produced, and her commitment to representing the female body in its idealized and less than ideal forms, in health and in abject sickness. I make the case that homage ought to be displayed as it is, a curatorial decision that assumes a more generous and expansive understanding of what it means to preserve and care for works of art. Before I circle back to that conclusion, I just want to share a little bit of the argument that I make through Wilkie's work, especially for those joining us today who are less familiar with, um, with what she made in her lifetime. Vulnerability, in my view, is one of the defining features of Wilkie's approach to art making. From the way that she fastened latex sheets together with visible metal snaps, which you can see very clearly in this example, giving the work a provisionality and an erotic charge, to the many ways in which she aligned her often nude body with her work. And here you can see her with one of her installations of these latex rosettes um, in a, a work that was meant to be published in art news, but was censored and printed instead with a clothed version of her. Um, here she is in photos that were privately kept that are in the archive here in Los Angeles um, of her pouring her latex works while naked, a common practice in her studio. Um, and then here, uh, a still from her incredible strip tease with Marcel Duchamp's um, large glass at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, a video that, um, a performance that Hannah did in the, in the museum and then became a video in, in 1976. Though there were critics who objected to what they saw as Wilkie's exploitation of her own sexuality to advance her artistic career, for Wilkie, beauty went hand in hand with disfiguration and attraction with repulsion as her SOS series in particular makes clear. And in this series, um, which is perhaps one of her most famous works, uh, she has bedecked herself with these tiny vulvas made of chewing gum that look quite a lot like boils or other kinds of um, bodily deformations. The statement she wrote for a Guggenheim Fellowship in 1976 summarizes the attitude she adopted. Quote, since 1960, I have been concerned with the creation of a formal imagery that is specifically female, a new language that fuses mind and body into erotic objects that are nameable and at the same time quite abstract. Its content has always related to my own body and feelings, reflecting pleasure as well as pain, the ambiguity and complexity of emotions. Human gestures, multi-layered metaphysical symbols below the gut level translated into an art close to laughter, making love, shaking hands, chewing gum into androgynous objects, rearranging the touch of sensuality with a residual magic made from laundry lint or latex loosely laid out like love vulnerably exposed, 
continually exposing myself to whatever situation occurs, gamboling as well as gambling, end quote. Wilkie's openness to whatever situation occurs turned out to have profound and unexpected consequences for her. Unlike the other feminist artists of her time, most of whom stopped featuring their own naked bodies in their work when those bodies began bearing signs of age, Wilkie chose to photograph her own body at its absolute weakest in the wake of her diagnosis with lymphoma in 1987, culminating in a body of work titled Intravenous. Unknowingly, Wilkie had prepared herself to wryly document her own bodily deterioration through the photograph she had made of her mother, Selma Butter, between 1978 and 1982, when cancer was ravaging her body, a body to which Wilkie was in so many ways intimately connected. And as you can see, she's making that connection rather evident in um, probably the best known work from this series where she's pictured herself in a diptych along with her mother. There is no doubt that Wilkie's drive to document her mother's struggle with cancer as well as her own grew from an intense desire to remain productive and to survive, but the images themselves speak to the body's inevitable decay and demise and to an interest in ephemerality that Wilkie had expressed earlier in her career, speaking of a desire to make things that, quote, aren't really about forever, or her admiration for art that has a, quote, planned obsolescence. The notion of obsolescence also appears in her letters to latex suppliers in the early 1970s. Though she was eagerly inquiring about a solution to latex's instability, she nonetheless admitted an awareness of the work's limitations. In a letter to General Latex and Chemical Corporation from September 1973, she writes, I realize that complete permanency might be impossible to achieve, but I would be quite satisfied with being able to give a 10 to 20 year guarantee on the sculpture more if possible. This rather radical acceptance of impermanence, her openness to whatever happens, to work that might cease to exist, to a notion of art that is not necessarily about forever, was not simply the price she paid for working with fugitive new materials. It is instead one of the most elemental features of her work, from her latex sculptures to her photographs of cancer-stricken bodies. The critical question, which was never posed to her in her lifetime, now comes into focus. When the work exceeds its 10 to 20 year guarantee and ceases to look and function as it once did, what should be done with it? This is precisely the conundrum presented by homage, which can continue to sit in storage, be destroyed, or go on view with or without some level of conservation. Many institutions would claim to be merely exercising caution in harboring but never exhibiting a work like homage. But to keep such a work indefinitely in storage is no doubt to impoverish it further. While the work is no longer in the form that Wilkie initially intended, it now speaks much more clearly and forcefully to the poetics of her body of work, to her deeply felt affinity for the gesture, arrested in time and space by the work of art, and for its eventual decay. Sometimes decay in works of art is distracting, and at other times, it is paradoxically illuminating. In the case of Wilkie's homage, we find a profound consonance between the sculpture's rapid decline and its place in an oeuvre that was increase, increasingly focused on the body and its vulnerabilities. To borrow a phrase from curator Anne Temkin, homage in its present condition is, however improbably, quote, the state of the work of art that is right for itself. And as such, it deserves to be seen, to be enlivened, even if it cannot be made whole again. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you for that presentation. And I love that idea of enlivening artwork. Maybe that's um, a concept that we can keep in our heads um, for the discussion. Thank you. And now I will introduce our last speaker, last but not least, our third uh, excellent Hannah of the evening, Hannah B. Higgins is Professor of Art History and Founding Director of the Interdisciplinary Education in the Arts or IDEAS program at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Her wide interests in research and teaching include Dadaism, Surrealism, Fluxus, Happenings, Performance Art, Food Art, and Early Computer Art. Hannah has received many illustrious fellowships and written many excellent publications, of which I will particularly mention her books 
Fluxus Experience from the University of California Press in 2002, and The Grid Book from the MIT Press in 2009. Hannah, I'm going to cross my fingers that your presentation will work. Can you unmute yourself? Ah, perfect. Great. And Hannah, if you would like me to uh, run your presentation, just, just let me know. Yeah, I think that's probably a good idea. Um, okay, great. First of all, thank you so much to uh, Hannah Hurling. I, uh, I think we first met uh, while you were uh, working with the Bard Graduate Center on the uh, Zen for Film project. And it's uh, such a pleasure to um, see this line of inquiry grow and evolve, um, uh, thanks in large part to your work. So uh, thank you so much. And my apologies to uh, the group, um, all of you in the audience and to my fellow presenters. Um, I'm at a location with very poor Wi-Fi, so this was our compromise. I have no idea what, if any of me, um, you can actually see through the video. And um, I want to thank um, uh, 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 Jules for um, running my PowerPoint. So, um, so I thought what I would do um, is give a little bit of background for why uh, the decision to publish a script um, in a in a publication like this. Um, it was not in my introduction, um, but it, it matters that I'm the daughter of uh, Dick Higgins and Allison Knowles, both Fluxus artists. And uh, I didn't become an art historian in order to write about their work. Um, my only book specific to Fluxus is actually Fluxus Experience. Uh, but as I was finishing my PhD uh, back around 1992 and three, um, <clears throat> I found myself at presentations, um, giving scholarly presentations that were the sort of academic side of larger conferences that also had artists, uh, sometimes my folks, sometimes other performance people. And I was struck that uh, for me, I kind of, it's not that I wanted to be in the performances, it's that I was learning something fundamentally different from the performances than I was able to learn from the writing about them. Um, and it's not a critique specifically. Um, it just has to do with what's possible uh, through embodied knowing and the limitations of, um, of description. And so um, uh, in, in my dissertation and then especially in Fluxus Experience, um, I really became fixated on what what experience means. Um, I was at the time reading a lot of John Dewey. Uh, John Dewey is um, associated with the progressive move in education um, with participatory models of education and specifically with the types of knowing that happen when an expert meets a student in the middle ground. So the point isn't to do away with experts, it's to use that middle domain as the place where education happens. And I know that these days that's what, that's what most educators are, are talking about uh, and trying to do. Um, but Dewey's model of experience um, uh, became a kind of a magic key uh, for thinking about what, what a fluxus event is. And then what I might do by thinking about my academic performance of lectures using that model. Um, and so, you know, the, the one, of, um, one of Dewey's famous quotes, uh, quote, we always live at the time we live and not at some other time. And only by extracting at each present time the full meaning of each present experience are we prepared for doing the same thing in the future. So just rereading that, um, only by extracting at each present time the full meaning of each present experience are we prepared for doing the same thing in the future. And so uh, what that 
essentially says is that repetition is impossible. And as a result, I wrote about, um, I wrote against a sort of strict reperformance. Uh, I think no one in this group would, would argue uh, too passionately um, for that. And then I needed tools. I needed a mechanism for thinking about um, how that bridge might work. And so this is where um, I wrote the script uh, with input from my mother uh, called Fluxus with Tools. Next slide. Can you hear me? Yes, can we can hear, hear me? you very well. Is, is, yes, great, we can hear you great, great Next actually. Slide. Is, the, is this the right slide? Right. Next slide. Okay. Next slide, yeah, perfect. Next. And so, of course, this takes us to classrooms. And um, uh, John sorry. Cage taught a course in experimental composition. Um, uh, not, the slide before that one, please. The Flux with Tools slide. Wait. Uh, this uh, is one slide too late. That's okay. There we go. Perfect. Um, so this is an advertisement. Uh, sorry, slide number two. Let's use the number. Oh, yeah. Set. Sorry, there's a bit of a delay. So the, the one, oh, the one right. with John Cage, yeah? Yeah, the one with John Cage. And Got so it. this is an advert. This is an advertisement that um, I uh, that Cage published in the catalog for the New School uh, course in 1956, and he taught this course several times. Uh, here's then the ad says experimental music, a course in musical composition with technological, musicological, and philosophical aspects, open to those with or without previous training. Whereas conventional theories of harmony, counterpoint, and musical form are based on the pitch and frequency components of sounds, this course offers problems and solutions in the field of composition based on other components of sound, duration, timbre, amplitude, and morphology. The course also encourages inventiveness. So let's go to the next slide. The people in Cage's class came from uh, chemistry. Uh, George Brecht was a chemist. Um, they came from poetry. Uh, they were uh, surely also trained artists. And they were um, committed to thinking about what, what music might be, it kind of in a sense, um, I'm actually reminded of what uh, Andrea was saying about um, about Simone Forti, who's also ultimately ends up moving in this same circle. This notion of timbre is very much about a physical environment, um, the things that produce sound, um, and thinking about the philosophy in terms of those things was extremely rich for all of these people, um, especially for George Brecht, who invents the concept of the performance event in this class uh, that's taught by Cage. Can we go to the next slide? So here's an event written by Milan Knizhak. It's called Fashion Event. Cut a coat along its entire length. Wear each half separately, 1965. So in the lecture, I and sometimes my mother or some other performer reader, it could also be an art historian, would cut the coat one of us was wearing in half and give the other half to the other person, essentially splitting up our roles um, that we had to play, right? Stretching the concept of uh, who is the artist and who is the, who is the historian. Um, but you'll see most of, what, most of what is in Fluxus with Tools contain this word event. Um, event is very specific and it matters that it was, it was, conceptualized by George Brecht, right? In physics um, and in science, relativity is about a unique point in space-time. Um, space and time are not conceived as separate entities, uh, but they are, they, they interact in unique ways, neither of which is really at all stable, we now know um, from, from contemporary physics. Next slide, please. So in that, uh, fashion event by Milan Knizhak, um, you need a coat and you need a pair of scissors, right? So um, tools, tool being is a concept um, associated with Martin Heidegger <coughs> in being and time. He writes about tool being. Tool being is not just the thing you use, 
to to cut the coat or to wear the coat. It's not just about the the matter. It's also about the ways people can relate to each other. This would be a more contemporary slang concept, a person becoming a tool. Um, and so um, tool being is a way of getting into the matter. So this became really interesting for me as, um, as a kind of way to think about Dewey experience socially. Next slide. This is um, Allison's uh, best known piece, probably Make a Salad. Um, this piece would run for the whole duration of the script. Um, so make this so the salad table has been set up on the, on the wherever you are, and whoever's not, not reading from the text, because we would take turns in the text, as you can see in the published script, can be uh, essentially using the table to demonstrate this idea of tools and time and the inseparability of those two. Next slide, please. Orange event number 16 by Bank Doc Klintberg. He's a uh, really under, deeply underappreciated um, uh, Swedish fluxus artist. Um, here too, the oranges can be set anywhere in the space. And um, I hope that you're imagining that for the reader, I mean, sorry, for the person who's watching this play play out, um, they're beginning to notice that the space they're in is becoming essentially an event space. Next image, please. Dripping by George Brecht. Um, in this piece, um, a water pitcher or a one source of pouring water and a glass are, um, or a container are put in some relationship to each other so that you hear the sound uh, going into uh, the water moving into the um, into the glass. Next image. Right here, we're moving into food. Next image. Sorry, I don't want to. I don't want to take up more than my time. Um, this is Dick's work with butter and eggs for a time. We're back into the domain of food. Um, you may also notice that a number of these pieces make weird sounds. There's chopping sounds, there's slopping sounds, there's dripping sounds. Um, so they are in some way evoking um, the, the Cajun notion of non-musical sound, which is central to what he was teaching um, at the um, uh, non-instrumental sound, I should say, uh, in his course in composition. So Cage kind of pulls through all of this. Next, please. The duration slide. Um, this notion of tool being and Heideggerian, um, he that sort of Heideggerian thinking and Cage's Cage's interests and Brecht's interests was missing something really essential for me. Um, I think it's um, it's a flaw in my first book. I you know I have these fantasies of um, doing another version of it that accounts for maybe a less um, homogenized sense of the body, a less homogenized sense of, of what sensation is, um, a kind of opening up more to the global side of, of fluxus. But it, it's what I could do at the time. Um, but missing there was really, I think, a theory of, of time that could account for some of, some of what, um, like, what, for example, what Gregory um, was talking about when he was talking about uh, the once-ness of Paik. Um, this uh, piece here by Larry Miller Slab is simply a, a, a coffin-sized slab of carrots that approximates his own weight. Uh, and then t these three photographs show those same carrots over the course of time as they, as they change. Uh, and Bergsonian time, the long duration, is cumulative. Um, so time, essentially, there's no such thing really as a point in time that is separate from the points in time before and after it. Time is, is always accumulating meaning. And this is one of the challenges really of performance art. It's an issue that comes up over and over again, is um, how do we as scholars um, preserve the immediacy and the element of surprise 
that made the piece what it was when it was made. And this takes us back again to the Deweyan idea, um, the, the, the concept of always needing to, to renew experience in order to learn with it uh, what's happening moving forward. That's very ultimately a very Bergsonian way of, um, of thinking about uh, experience. And so this moves us, there's some humor here, uh, next image, into, uh, for example, Ben Bocchier's Flux Mystery Food, uh, which is canned food, right? Food that's supposed to last forever. Uh, so it's the opposite, in a sense, of, um, of what Larry Miller uh, was doing with his piece um, in this example uh, of Ben Bocchier's Flux Mystery Food. He didn't know what was in the can. And then you have beautiful videos of him opening these cans and eating kind of whatever was in it. It was a cheap way to buy food. Um, it's part, it's one way that um, George Machunas was able to live on such a low budget. You could go to the grocery store in the 1960s um, and there would be a, a bin of cans where the labels had fallen off and the food was basically free. Uh, so this was a way to, to eat, uh, eat for very little, but obviously it was a, a total crapshoot. Next slide. Um, actually skip the next slide. Uh, just move through it really fast because I'm, I'm way over time. Um, um, I end Fluxus um, with tools, with a discussion of Fluxus banquets. Uh, these were uh, events that happened in the late 60s and, and to the mid-1970s, artists getting together and eating food together. This is an attempt at an art history joke. Obviously, this is a Bruegel, a Bruegel image of, um, of conviviality. And um, I think conviviality is something that... Um, we could think about a lot more as scholars. Um, I love Greg Chalet's work on dark matter for this, uh, for really thinking about what communities of artists are like uh, and what the simple fact of community can do. And next image by Eric Anderson is the last piece. Uh, this is Eric evoking a kind of conviviality in his piece, uh, Please Leave, um, from Russ Kilda in 1985, where he would have a a table loaded with uh, wonderful food, and um, uh, he would then invite the audience to take something from the table, but once they took it, they had to leave. And so it evoked, you know, tremendous tension between the desire to um, stay and see what's going to happen next um, or to depart with the good thing. Uh, so, you know, and, and folks not wanting to seem greedy for the good thing, uh, but also not wanting to seem kind of greedy for an experience that ultimately became quite dull, right? Sitting for hours, waiting, you know, waiting while this thing played out. So also uh, very much about time, but obviously um, uh, with regard to this question of the preservation of performance, uh, the main point of Anderson's piece is that what people desire is a product of kind of who they are and where they live and what matters to them and what their values are and what their relationship is to everyone in the room. And that's what makes the piece fresh. So in terms of uh, this question of over-reliance on photographs of performance, while photographs are indeed very useful um, to try to meticulously reconstruct this photograph in order to produce anything like the, um, the experience of that day um, would be patently absurd. And so um, this is where the limits of photography with regard to performance are, as this group knows extremely well. I'm seeing it in every presentation, um, uh, really, really a problem for, um, for, for scholars. So um, Hannah, I see your work is so involved and so, so engaged and um, relevant for, uh, for what we're all trying to do here. And thank you very much for giving us a context. And thank you all for your patience with my terrible uh, technology. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Hannah. And, and please stick around. Uh, I invite uh, all of the speakers to turn on their audio, turn on their cameras and join us. Uh, I saw that we had a question in the chat about whether this will be recorded. We are recording this, um, which is also good to know if you wanted to, to ask a question. So please um, go ahead and join, uh, join the conversation in the chat. 
Um, but I, as, as MC of this evening's event, get the uh, pleasure and privilege of the first question. Uh, and I was thinking about um, what brings all of these different contributions together. And one, one idea that really struck me was, um, uh, as Hannah was picking up on as well just now, this idea of onceness from, from Nanjun Pike and uh, this wonderful idea he has that you can only break a piano once, right? Then it's broken and you can't put it back together. And, and essentially what he's describing there is entropy, right? Which is interesting to me because entropy is so often what conservation is working against. So I wonder um, if any of you have any comments on how entropy as a kind of um, positive force in art uh, is something that we can use to reconsider how we think about um, the, the kind of long-term life uh, of an artwork. And if I had a follow-up question, it would probably be about homeostasis and neg entropy, uh, since we have so many works that involve food as well. It's a question for everybody, so feel free to jump in. I, I can start if, uh, if I may. Um, it's, it's a very interesting question, Jules. Thank you so much. And, and thank you again, uh, everyone who contributed for this wonderful um, interventions. Um, I really like uh, the question about entropy because I think conservation um, is sometimes um, perhaps too easily associated with this notion that you know it works against uh, entropy. I mean, in kind of perhaps classical conservation, uh, quite often related to uh, traditional works of art, such as painting, sculpture, more stable works of art. Obviously, today we we are moving away from those um, from those notions more and more, and nonetheless, they are pretty uh, pretty useful in many contexts. Um, this this kind of you know the the achievement of stability is something that that we really uh, kind of uh, try try to pursue through this kind of more traditional lens. But um, more and more in those works, especially created you know since the mid 19th 20th century, um, it is it is quite often the case that conservation actually accepts changeability and change. It works ex existing extant in time, and I believe you know that. Um, if we go away from perhaps uh, this kind of iterant installative work that materialize intermittently, but look closer at, I don't know, also a painting that, you know, decays uh, over time, or as this wonderful uh, artworks by Larry Miller, Miller that um, Hannah Higgins just brought up. Um, I think, uh, you know, the acceptance of this changeability involves also the acceptance of uh, entropy. Um, and I think in Andrea Girodi's, you know, beautiful contribution with um, uh, Hannah Wilkie's uh, pieces, you know, this kind of bringing back to the limelight of a piece that actually, according to say, perhaps a standard or more conventional look uh, or approach and ask what which would be long gone and perhaps which would spend its entire life in the storage. Um, would be no, no more kind of conservable, no more kind of uh, appreciated for uh, for its uh, for its obviously really appealing aesthetics as well. You know, um, I think if we rethink those this notion of uh, of conservation, if we approach it uh, truly as um, as something that not only manages this was another notion I think that was very present over the last decades, but something that that accepts change that even you know invites change and and tries to kind of be constructed and theorized along those notions that then we are we are fine with them. I could if speak I, more, but I, I'm gonna put yeah I'm gonna be over. Andrew, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm gonna jump in. Um, Hannah, thank you for starting that because I think. Yes, there is certainly much more acceptance around changeability in conservation practice now, but I think there's still this question of how much entropy do we allow before the artwork becomes part of the archive or a relic and no longer the work itself. And I struggled with that question mm. around Wilkie's work. And I looked to her for instruction as to whether her practice would allow me to think about that work as still the work and not simply as 
a relic or you know an archival object um, and no longer you know the, the proper work of art but i think that's where there continues to be disagreement and there are a lot of artists estates that weigh in on these questions and want to say you know that work doesn't look like when the artist made it and now it needs to be relegated to the archive and can no longer be shown as the work um so there are other you know sort of constituencies that weigh in on these questions too beyond just conservators and curators but that i think is a really um critical question when we're talking about works that have this um fugitive quality yeah thank, thanks for that andrea uh, i would just add to that that you know i think entropy and maybe more um specifically to someone like peg destruction is a way of challenging hierarchical value systems um saying if you're going to destroy an old instrument for example you are making a comment about what is valued right the the object versus a person um an institutional affiliation versus a public um they're just they're 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 even though we think of destruction as you know bad in a lot of ways there are ways that it can really release a lot of different energies and ask us uh allow us to ask a lot of different questions mm. yeah and i would also add uh since i think megan unfortunately had to leave us i think the onion walk is a great example of a form of destruction right the, the an onion that has sprouted is an onion that's no longer good to eat right but it's exactly the release of energies that allows the onion mm. to walk. I, um, I love that um, because I think what this gets at is um, the recognition. Uh, you know, Christine Stiles has written about this really beautifully. Um, that destruction of destruction creation, right? Mm. That the onion that is not never allowed to sprout is is dead. Right, mm -hmm. and we're really advocating for something here that that um, that has a kind of ethics of of uh, of a certain kind of attitude of living and and being part of futurity. Um, and I I think uh, what I took a note uh, when when Greg was talking. Um, I said, uh, "Onceness is democratic," um, and I, I think that is is so absolutely kind of the right attitude there's a there is an ethics in this conversation that goes so far i mean it's what art can do right art can can provisionally propose alternatives to our dominant mindset and this this work and this this thinking is so critical politically right now um mm -hmm. and so i just i i i commend i commend this not just as scholars kind of in our or bubble in a sense, um, but 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 attitudinally. Um, <clears throat> sorry, sorry for the rant, um, but I I think there's it's kind of uh, remarkable to hear this uh, so crisply said. Um, and certainly Hannah Wilkie, Hannah Wilkie's cancer is the chaos into which every one of our bodies recycles, right? And that's in in the Miller piece too. Hmm. Oh, I had one other yeah. thought. Uh, sorry, um, and that and that is um, since I'm connected to an artist's estate, um, my father's obviously my mother's doing just fine. Um, but in a life, I think um, there can be a feeling when you're young that um, you you'll always have have great ideas and be producing the work that matters. And so if I look at a lot of artists, they are more willing to destroy um, and to engage in creative destruction as young artists than when they kind of hit a certain age. And I'm not sure why that is, but it's certainly true of even like a Chris Burden or it just seems to happen. And I wonder if any of you have any thoughts about that? Like, what is the relationship between some of these ideas and biography? Can I jump in yeah, to say a great question thing there, which is that, you know, I think something that I've encountered quite a bit is young artists who, and this is true even now when I do studio visits and I have this conservation mindset and I ask artists, 
do you know what the longevity of that material is? Like how, you know, how, how is it going to behave in five years, 10 years? And we think of plastic as this thing that can exist forever. And of course it does not. It has uh, an expiration date within our lifetimes. Um, and so there is this, I think, kind of like beautiful carefreeness around materiality where you're, you're worried about the now when you're making the work. And it's as artists get to a different point in their career um, and have resources like conservators they can call up to ask questions about the materials they're working with, um, that, that that mindset shifts. But you know that I think then those objects wind up in museum collections, obviously. And uh, we wonder, okay, what do we do with this thing that was made with kind of provisional materials, maybe because that's what was available and we know it's gonna have an expiration date in terms of it looking as it once did. So, so are you are you um, saying, Andrea, that um, <clears throat> that these are different orders of time? That the young artist hasn't mm -hmm. seen the materials begin to decay. Whether they're ever going to wind up in a museum is kind of a separate question. Um, and that as they move through their creative life, um, they they see that decay and they realize like a decade or twenty years is actually very little time. Yep. Um, Interesting. Absolutely. I just had a studio visit with somebody and I asked them about this um, sort of latex based material that they were lay layering onto plastic. And I asked, you know, do you know if this changes over time? Like, is it going to discolor? Is it going to get brittle? And they said, oh, I've been working with it, with it for a year. It's fine. And I was like, oh, God, a year, like a year. <laughs> this thing is maybe going to live, you know, for a much longer time. And I just said, okay, you know, that's great. Um, I didn't want to burst their bubble, but those, you know, I think that, yeah, over the course of a career, you get to see what happens with your work in a way that you don't when you're young and playing in the studio. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I can add to this, uh, if I may jump on, uh, it's very, it's very interesting um, what you are just saying, Andrea and, and Hannah too, because, uh, you know, especially from the perspective of, uh, of conservators, uh, we are doing quite a lot of conducting quite a lot of artist interviews and, you know, very kind of material, we pursue very material oriented approaches often and in our um, questions we ask the artists what kind of materials they use, are they kind of durable or not and so on, and it itself is kind of intervention in longevity, by, right, because, uh, you know, even by, yes, even by kind of posing this question, one implies that the work have to kind of continue, which is interesting, but I love that, uh, you know, that artists actually um, have this changeability sometimes plumped into the work and sometimes not. It is intended or unintended. Sometimes this, you know, the change or the destruction even of materials is, is kind of intrinsic or even internal to the work. And sometimes it is external. So there is a huge complexity I think one could speak about. And going back to Pike, obviously, you know, he's a wonderful example. And I, I bet Greg will also agree. Uh, as, as Pike scholar, that you know, in his early age, he was a, a, a almost termed, you know, a destruction artist with, with very kind of, um, with very kind of all these performative gestures where he destroys instruments, uh, you know, um, paints with own hats and uh, has has kind of yeah a very almost brutal um, approach to art making. Yeah, thanks everyone. Um, I'm sure we could go on uh, about these issues, but I'd also like to, we have some great questions in the chat and I'd like to share with you a question from Jane Henderson. Hi Jane, uh, who says, I would enjoy hearing you all elaborate on the idea that objects can die. If we accept the premise that they can die, how do we define the death of an object and what is the role of conservation in this? Are we the ones holding a metaphorical watch in the ER ward calling it, or do we just wheel away the bodies? And I think, um, I love this question. Um, I think this question was actually asked before Hannah started uh, talking about um, the kind of biographical, you know, the life cycle that we all human beings go through and how that affects the way we, we might feel about our own artistic production or about that of others. And of course, also the life cycle of an onion, the life cycle of a bunch of carrots. So yeah, uh, does anyone have any have any thoughts on James' question? Do artworks die? Andrea, you wanna go? I, I can. I can. 
Sure. I mean, my very short answer is yes. Um, but I, I think, you know, defining the limits of like wh when to call it in the ER um, is the really hard part because I think, you know, I've seen um, artworks that I did, and this is a, a shout out to anybody who would be eligible for this program. There's a fantastic um, summer institute in technical art history that now happens at Harvard, but it used to happen at NYU at the IFA um, that I did back in the summer of 2013. And I think if I had not done that institute, seeing Wilkie's work in storage would have meant something very different to me. Um, but having done that institute, we had, you know, really like backdoor access to conservation at MoMA and the Met and other places and could have very honest conversations about works of art that otherwise we would never have been allowed to see. And I remember seeing, um, I think it was uh, like a tiny fiberglass work by Nam Gabo um, an, or another Russian constructivist and it had just been shattered into little pieces. And there is literally no way that anyone could take that from that back to anything sculptural like it's just not possible so that is a work that i would feel comfortable saying is dead they keep it in you know a, sort of a little shoebox in the archive because the material seems to still have value to them but it's not something that could ever be shown um whereas with wilkie's work it's like yes this has been sort of effectively declared dead by a conservator but simply because it can't hang on the wall like it once did and my question there is, okay, but what else can we do with it? Like, is it still alive in a different sense than it once was? Um, and, you know, I I think with every work of art, there's a case study to be had in thinking about where those lines and boundaries are. Yeah, I would just add to that, that I think, you know, it's, uh, and many of you have much more experience with conservation than I do. So, but I, I will say that, you know, art is more than its material components, right? I mean, it's also ideas and concepts. And so I think of something like Pake's TV crown when it's in a museum now. And originally you were supposed to be able to come in and turn the dials and create images yourself, right? Now you can't, you're not allowed to touch it, right? So it's been materially preserved, but I would say it's kind of a date brain dead version of the piece because you're not, what's not being preserved is the interactivity and the sort of invitation for the viewer to become a producer, right? To become an image maker. And so that's another thing that I always get hung up on, which is like, there, there's the material conservation, but there's also the conceptual or the idea, you know, how can you preserve an idea? Yes, and also I think that's that's beautifully put, but I also think, and I must say, I, I admit the SISTA is one of the best, uh, um, uh, programs that happens uh, organized currently um, by Francesca Bauer at, at the Harvard and I have this possibility to contribute to this program as well so a great mention Andrea thank you but but I must say that um, you know I think that it very much also relates to our conception of the artwork itself our understanding what the artwork is if we for instance assume and Jane is writing in the comments um, about the bits and pieces in the box, uh, whether you know what are the perceived value of this. I think if we if we take performance and think of performance as only the the life event, right, that happens in mm -hmm. the moment, and nothing else that is, um, so say the leftovers, perhaps the you know the um, embodied knowledge and and all this kind of documentation and and stratigraphies of different sorts of. Um, documents that happen around performance if we if we conceive perf performance as only the event then it might be that the relics are the dead object but if we think about it in a more kind of all-encompassing way then you know the remnants might also live on and even perhaps have their own performances and and i i tend to think about uh pipe, uh, pipe artworks uh, in this terms obviously one one can uh, see you know a turn of then uh, for TV uh, in a gallery, um, you know, exposing just this kind of burns in the line in the phosphor um, uh, coating uh, of the monitor um, as a mm -hmm. dead work. But in fact, I, I believe that, you know, it is, it is in a sense, the, still the work, perhaps lacking one of its uh, many performative uh, components. Excellent, uh, excellent points, everyone. We've got a lot, actually, we've got a lot going on in the chat. Um, 
We have a question from Heather Galloway. Thank you, Heather. Aren't museums in a larger sense, rather than the conservator, uh, by not showing an object, sending the message that the object is dead? Conservation doesn't have to write the death certificate. That's right, conservators aren't the only ones making these decisions. And as you point out, Heather, it might not always necessarily even be a conscious decision, right? Objects can be kind of in limbo. Well, I think we probably should start wrapping up, unless there are any final comments. I mean, I'm, we could certainly go on. Other and um, other authors uh, still with us. Um, let's put perhaps turn on the screens and and um, and say hi. Yes. At least. Um, other contributors to the volume. I'm seeing Susanna Neubauer, right? Unfortunately, I have to leave and thank you. But perhaps um, there is still someone around um, that we could um, say, oh, Hannah is still around. This is great. <laughs> we see your image. Um, I'm hearing Johannes in the next room, but I'm not quite sure if he's maybe sitting now, if he's able to turn on his screen. Rebecca, um, Rebecca's here, Rebecca's, but has, has to leave. Yeah, yes. Rebecca just yeah. Left. It, it was great to have you, Rebecca. That's great that you could join. Um, this was really lovely. Thank you so much. Oh, thank I you, Hannah. Thank you for your wonderful yeah, contributions. Really, really lovely. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thanks so much. I, I give the word back to Jules, right? Jules, you will, you will probably wrap up because this would be the moment. Uh, but I just want to thank everyone. Oh, Johannes is here. Hi, Johannes, author of the last chapter in the volume on his um, blog project. So this is a processual, um, a processual piece that travels the world. Um, and Jules is wrapping up, so I'm giving and the screen over to her. Yes, I just want to um, say thank you to everyone. Thank you to Hannah. Thank you to um, all of the speakers. Thank you to all of the wonderful contributors to this um, really exciting book um, who were uh, who were with us tonight, who were not. Thank you to everyone uh, who came, especially to everyone who's still here. You get extra points. Um, thank you very much to Sophia Fries, who was our crack technical assistant this evening. Uh, many thanks to the SNF and the Hakabe for their support. Uh, and before we all um, go our separate ways for the morning, afternoon, or evening, I would just like to make everyone aware of the next event happening within the frame of the Performance Conservation Project. We're having our first in-person event, but it will also be streamed online. But come join us in Bern if you can. We have a number of really exciting artists who've already agreed to take part on May 16th. Um, speaking about their uh, interests and experiences with performance conservation from many different angles. Um, and there are going to be some live performances as well. So we'd really love to see you there. And if you want to stay up to date with our future activities, I recommend that you sign up for our, I promise, very sporadic newsletter. Um, and thank you all for your comments and for joining us today. We'll see you hopefully next time.